Hi. In today's space brief, we'll answer the question, what is NASA doing to further the investigation for life in the solar system? We'll talk about what we're doing to protect the planet against killer asteroids. And I'll answer the question, what the U.S. is going to do to protect the commercial sector against anti-satellite weapons by Russia. This much and more. Stick around. Hello and welcome to The Undiscovered Country. I am your host, Bryant A.M. Baker. In this show, we count down the top five most important things happening in the world of space. I'm glad you're on this journey with me, and I'm so happy for you to be coming with me uh, on the, the process of getting a little bit better, uh, presenting things a little bit better, and, and hopefully offering up the information that you need to be able to follow the most important things happening in this incredible sector today. First thing that I want to talk about today is an announcement by NASA scientists that they have developed a new device to be able to autonomously detect life in the watery plumes that are shooting into space out of moons like Enceladus as well as Europa. Enceladus is a moon of Saturn, while Europa uh, is a moon that orbits around Jupiter, and both of these locations have long been suspected of potentially harboring life due to the existence of liquid oceans on the surface. Now, in the future, spacecraft would be equipped with this, these new devices that NASA labels their ocean world life surveyors or owls, which I think is a lot of fun, which could uh, detect microorganisms in these geysers. Lucas Mandrake, who is the OWL's instrument uh, autonomy system engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, said in a statement, we're starting to ask questions now that necessitate more sophisticated instruments. Are some of these other planets habitable? Is there defensible scientific evidence for life rather than a hint that it might be there? That requires instruments that take a lot of, a lot of data, and that's what OWLs in its science autonomy is set up to accomplish. Now, while the OWLs uh, development is going to be too late to be able to get to the next mission uh, to these icy moons, uh, specifically the European Space Agency's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE, you got to love these abbreviations, which is currently scheduled for 2023 or for NASA's Europa Clipper mission, which launches in 2024. However, in the very near future, NASA is hoping to be able to include this equipment to answer these important questions regarding life on these icy moons. Next in launch news, the Joint Polar Satellite System 2 or JPSS-2 for short, was supposed to launch on a United Launch Alliance or ULA Atlas V rocket from California and Vandenberg uh, on, the, on the first. However, over the weekend, NASA and ULA uh, announced that the launch needs to be pushed off to at least next Wednesday, uh, November 9th, due to the need to replace a faulty battery uh, as part of the Atlas V's Centaur upper stage. Now, no reasoning as to what failed in the battery, only that it needed to be replaced. However, um, uh, once this satellite is able to be put into this uh, into orbit, JPSS-2's data will aid scientists in a variety of ways, including improving weather forecasts to monitoring the impacts of climate change. Uh, also, packed atop the, the Atlas V is an inflatable heat shield uh, called the Low Earth Orbit Flight Test of an Inflatable de uh, de Decelerator, or lofted, Lofted will ride to orbit and then come back to Earth at high speed before deploying uh, de parachutes and splashing down on the Pacific Ocean for the purpose of trying to test out new ways to, to use heat shields and potentially carry a much larger heat shield in a much smaller package to be able to uh, give services to a variety of different kinds of equipment up in orbit. Researchers will study how Lofted performs during this test run to assess the potential of inflatable heat shields to land heavy payloads on other places as well, including Mars and other planets. Next, let's talk about asteroids. Astronomers have discovered a giant asteroid hitting it in the glare 
between the Earth and Venus. Uh, this this asteroid is 0 0.9 uh, meter, or I'm sorry, miles wide or 1.5 kilometers wide, and has been labeled a planet killer because of the huge amount of damage that it would cause if it made contact with the Earth. Now, the asteroid has been named 2022 APZ, and it, uh, scientists said that it had managed to avoid detection for so long because it orbits in the region between Earth and Venus, and turning our equipment in that direction would cause so much glare and, and damage due to the direct sunlight that it's escaped detection up until this point. Uh, Scott S. Shepard who's an astronomer at the Earth and Planets Laboratory of the Carnegie Institute for Science, as well as the lead author of the paper describing the new discovery, stated that only about 25 asteroids with orbits completely within Earth's orbit have been discovered to date because of this difficulty of observing near the glare of the sun. Now, discoveries like this uh, are being taken very seriously. Both the United States as well as China are developing uh, procedures and systems to be able to address these planet killer size asteroids that have the potential at some point of making contact with the earth. China has recently announced their planetary defense system, and this goes into it in addition to the United States recent successful mission, the DART mission, which launched a probe which actually made contact with and changed the orbit of a near earth asteroid. Now, I personally think that we, the Earth is most likely not in any immediate danger. Uh, I, I always hesitate to put too many resources into a mission like this. However, there is no escaping the fact that later, if not sooner, this type of equipment, this, these types of procedures will eventually be absolutely necessary. And it's a good thing that we're moving in that direction. Next, let's turn our attention to international news. The, the U.S. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby recently stated to reporters that if Russia were to attack U.S. commercial satellites, that the U.S. would respond in an appropriate way. So to give some context as to what this is talking about. Russia has stated that the Ukraine and the United States' use of Starlink and other commercial satellite providers uh, as part of their military efforts to, to fight back the Russian invasion in Ukraine, uh, that because they were using this equipment that Russia considered Starlink or, or other commercial uh, satellites as potential military targets in the near future if, if they continue to use it this way. Now, normally, under the laws of war, civilian targets are not allowed uh, in even in a legal war, which, of course, whether the invasion is a legal war or not is still hotly debated, though in my mind, it seems completely clear that it definitely is not. However, Russia giving warning to the UN because of the use of Starlink um, is is their way of saying in our interpretation because starlink is being used in this way we're going to see them as potential military targets kirby said that uh, the only thing that's provocative right now and dangerous is russia's war in ukraine and the manner in which they're prosecuting that war now, in in my mind there there is however philosophically on point Russia may or may not be with the use of Starlink. The fact of the matter is there's no doubt in my mind that them bringing this up or changing the focus to the dis discussion as to whether the United States has made Starlink a legitimate target or not is nothing more than a distraction from the real problem of this invasion. And while I, I look forward and, and am enjoying the intellectual debate of what this could mean for the space industry, my hope is that we don't get too bogged down into this information as it shouldn't ultimately matter in deciding whether or not Russia has a legitimate presence in their neighboring country or not. Because it's a completely different discussion. Finally, st sticking with the subject of international war in space, Australia, in a bit of good news, has announced that they are pledging not to conduct direct ascent anti-satellite missile testing, or ASATs, throwing its weight behind the U.S.-driven initiative that was launched in April to promote the peaceful and safe use of outer space. Now, Australia's pledge came about three weeks after the United Kingdom, South Korea, 
joined the initiative and, and, and raising the, the number of countries up to eight, which now includes, uh, is including the United Kingdom and South Korea, Japan, Germany, New Zealand, and Canada, which have all joined since April. Now, the United States is continuing to ramp up efforts to increase that number as well. The foreign minister in Australia, uh, as part of their announcement, stated the global community must work together to build a common understanding on rules and norms that can guide how states behave in outer space. This commitment to responsible behavior helps build a meaningful framework that contributes to the security, safety, and sustainability of outer space. Now, the real question that gets brought to mind here is whether these norms are going to be the, the savior that we all hope them to be. There's a lot of discussion, especially in the space legal community, as to the the binding nature of the creation of these types of norms. There's a strong argument to be made that if enemies of the United States or other countries, if they decide that it is in their best interest to to ignore norms like this, that they will just do it without any hesitation. And it's a strong argument to make. My take is that even if that is the case, we should continue to establish those norms and get international cooperation in these norms, both for the betterment of the space community at large, and also because it gives us something to compare and understand bad actions in the world in general. If we're going to try to say that we're making correct decisions in space, the only way to do that is to have something a correct decision to make to be able to compare that to bad acts in the future. Thank you for joining me for this discussion on the top five most important things happening in space. The links to all of the stories that I referred to are in the description. The, the world of space law and policy, business, uh, 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 the military uses, all of these things are changing so rapidly. It can, it can feel daunting. My purpose in making these is to give you an opportunity to be able to keep up with these things in the, in the comfort of your car on the way to work. I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of the stories that we talked about today. Like I said, we're currently in the process of trying to get to our first 100 subscribers. I'd love for you to be one of them. But check out the story that I did yesterday to, to catch up on what happened then if you missed it. But regardless, thank you for being here, and I'll see you again next time.